Brothers and sisters, aloha. I would like to thank the musicians, the prayers, the scripture, and the many people who helped bring me to this point today. I'm sorry you don't get to hear from my brilliant wife. She's covering her tempo shift. So I get to introduce myself. <clears throat> my resume is not unusual. I had great parents, served a mission, college, callings, jobs. Uh, I married my wonderful wife. We raised spectacular children. But even thinking about my life puts me to sleep. So <laughs> instead of the usual introductory list, I would like to share a story to help you understand my talk, but also understand me. I grew up in the Cold War. Uh, when I was 10 years old, my school gathered all fourth graders together to hear the bomb lecture, as it was called, a graphic explanation of what would happen to us if nuclear war erupted. After finishing a harrowing description of radiation poisoning, the teacher ended by declaring that if the sirens ever sounded, he'd jump in his truck, race to the nearest military base so he could be at ground zero when the bombs hit. That way, he explained, smiling cleverly, he wouldn't have to suffer like everybody else unlucky enough to live through it. With all the other dazed fourth graders, I stumbled out to recess, but his words kept echoing in my mind. <clears throat> That night, as I knelt down for prayers, I mustered the most sincere prayer my tiny heart had ever produced. Heavenly Father, please don't let the bombs come tonight. Tomorrow's my birthday. <laughs> if any of you have ever wondered why your parents or grandparents act or think the way they do, now you know. Our entire generation bore the weight of that experience. <clears throat> but fortunately for all of us, God answered my prayer that night and countless others since. Now looking back, I laugh at the experience, but at the time, I remember desperately needing God's assurance and receiving it. He always gives it, and I love him dearly for that. I love this world he created for us. I love watching his miracles unfold around us. I pray now that his spirit will attend my words so that somehow they might open a miracle for you. <clears throat> Doctrine and Covenants, section 93, illustrates some of the most sublime doctrines we have in Scripture. In it, the Lord teaches us about the premortal life, the creation, truth, light elements, and intelligences, the resurrection, agency, progress, evil, and much, much more. The revelation ends, however, with a somewhat mysterious set of instructions. And verily, I say unto you that it is my will that you should hasten to translate the Scriptures and to obtain a knowledge of history and of countries, and of kingdoms, of laws of God and man, and all this for the salvation of Zion. Amen. I remember reading verse 53 when I was a skinny 19-year-old missionary in the MTC trying to learn Mandarin. Verse 53 hit me like a bolt of lightning, and not in a good way, because I had no interest in history, or countries, or kingdoms, none. When I got my mission call to Taiwan, it took me an hour to find it on the map, literally. As I examined verse 53 again and again, I wondered out loud, why history? And why would Zion's salvation depend on it? Why not biology or geology or some interesting subject? <clears throat> this question haunted me for 36 years. Even after I got a PhD in history, I didn't understand. Slowly, however, the Lord awakened my mind. Now, when I read verse 53, it fills me with deep appreciation for his wisdom. Today, I'd like to share why section 93 and verse 53 specifically matter to me in the hope that my words might inspire you as well. Before we turn to DNC 93, however, I must explain two things quickly about memory of the past, or what I'll call historical memory. One, it's plastic. And two, it's power. Number one, our memory of the past is plastic. We can bend it into any shape we want. Today is June 4th, 2019. Exactly 30 years ago, June 4th, 1989, my good wife and I were, and the rest of the free world were riveted to our TV sets watching the Beijing student demonstrations on Tiananmen Square. The students had been protesting for weeks, calling for political reform and liberalization. Their courage raised hopes around the globe that something wonderful would follow. 
On June 4th, however, regime hardliners sent troops and tanks to shoot, crush, and scatter the protesters. Vivid reports of bloodshed shocked the world, but they also energized action elsewhere. Just five months later, protesters tore down the Berlin Wall. Two years after that, further demonstrations and reforms dissolved the Soviet Empire. My intent is not to explain what happened in 1989, <clears throat> but to explain what has happened since. In China today, those events of 30 years ago have been largely scrubbed from public memory, erased. For many Chinese, it's as if they never happened. In her book, The People's Republic of Amnesia, Louisa Lim details China's government's efforts to bleach the past. She describes the results. <clears throat> Quote, those who continue to remember the past are consigned to a life on the periphery because moving on, not dwelling on the past, has become a key survival tactic, perhaps the most important one. Young Chinese people have little idea of or little interest in what happened. Similar efforts to erase, bend, or obscure history also occur here in the United States, especially in the South, where activists are attacking memory of the Civil War era. In the UK, story symbols and statues tied to Britain's imperialist past face similar purges. The past is a gigantic tidal wave of trillions times trillions of data points, capturing every act, thought, feeling, reaction, exchange, and encounter ad nauseum of every particle and participant. What happened in the past is fixed. We can't change it. However, how we choose to remember the past changes all the time. To create memory of what happened, we choose which details matter how interactions are framed, how we feel about them, and then dump the remaining 99.9999%. In short, our memory changes, <clears throat> and we choose how. Number two, how we choose to remember the past matters immensely because it determines how we think, act, and interact right now. In short, historical memory has great power to shape society, and it does so in three important ways. It substantiates social values, it defines community, and it steers behavior. Histories are great at substantiating social values. Values constitute the bedrock foundation of all social order. However, by themselves, values all have a flaw. <clears throat> No matter how ideal, noble, or perfect they appear on paper, they generate disagreement and tension when you put them into practice. The problem is that if a value is true, worthy of our respect and loyalty, that truth is not evident or inherent in the value itself. For example, while some would definitely agree that honesty or modesty or spirituality matter, others will scoff. That's where history comes in. It gives weight to values, encouraging wider consensus and silencing critics. To Americans, the values freedom, liberty, and justice for all become more than just abstract ideals when showcased within the narrative surrounding July 4th, 1776. History substantiates values even if historical events repudiate them. It simply calls those events bad. Thus, the story of Adolf Hitler beautifully confirms the values of human dignity, compassion, and justice, because we saw what happened when his Nazis abandoned them. Values tell us how to set up our laws, customs, norms, and more. It's the job of history, however, to reveal the worth of those values and build support for them. All it needs to do is create a historical narrative, a story, pitting heroes who personify our values against villains who defy them. Conflict, tension, and drama result as good battles evil, progress faces down degeneration, kindness defies brutality, strength sweeps aside weakness, prosperity supplants poverty, knowledge trumps ignorance, or tolerance beats segregation. As the narrative unfolds, we cheer for the good. When certain values help good triumph, those values become valued by us and sink deep into our hearts. The second way historical memory shapes his social order <clears throat> is by defining community. We all live in multiple overlapping communities, <clears throat> family, city, nation, and so forth. Each relies on history, formal or not, to help members identify with it. 
History explains the community's origins, hierarchy, purpose, roster, enemies, allies, visions, setbacks, victories, possessions, culture, roles, and so on. Rare and beautiful, wonderful to its core, our community of BYU-Hawaii would dwindle and disintegrate if it ever stopped sharing the story of President McKay's vision with all who come and many across the globe who do not. That history passes our university's defining essence, person to person, generation to generation, motivating commitment, contribution, and consecration. The third way memory of the past shapes our society is by steering behavior. When history judges past figures as heroic or villainous, we naturally identify with the heroes and dislike the villains. Heroes defend our community and meet glorious ends, even if it means martyrdom. Villains betray our values and meet ugly fates. It's not the figures that history judges, it's the behavior. By showing what happens to Moses and Pharaoh, Alma and Korahor, Queen Esther and Jezebel, Churchill and Hitler, history encourages us to follow the heroic path. Good little girls hearing that Jezebel was eaten by dogs and Queen Esther saved her people all want to be Queen Esther on Halloween, not Jezebel. In sum, memory of the past shapes society by substantiating values, defining community, and steering behavior. These three qualities give history a voice. I call it a voice because it calls to us, seeking to persuade us to embrace the values, community, and behavior encapsulated within it. This voice, the raw creative power of social order, is why kings, emperors, sultans, dictators, presidents, popes, CEOs, politicians, celebrities, social activists, and parents of all teenagers possess a keen interest in historical memory. Whoever controls it can control society. Whoever controls it controls us. This brings us to DNC 93. In our day, an enormous range of different historical voices call to us. In the past, wars were fought over territory, religion, resources, slaves, ideologies, or other things. Today, wars are waged for our attention. Battles rage between different voices of history, each with its own set of values, community, and behavior. This new war operates by different rules. The pen is mightier than the sword is no longer accurate. Today, the pen is the sword. History is written by the victor is now reversed. Today, the writing of history happens first. As people embrace it, it is victory that follows. The sheer volume of these contending historical voices staggers the imagination. They reach everywhere. Their variety is confounding. All clamor for our attention and loyalty, and the resulting din and cacophony can spin people around in confusion. Many don't know what to believe or which one to follow. <clears throat> One reason the Lord gave us Doctrine and Covenants section 93 is because he wants us to know how to distinguish good voices from bad ones. In verses 24 and 26 of 93, the Lord describes good historical voice. He starts by defining truth. And truth is knowledge of things as they are, and as they were, and as they are to come. The spirit of truth is of God. I am the spirit of truth. And John bore record of me, saying, He received a fullness of truth, yea, even of all truth. By defining truth as a knowledge of things as they were, the Lord identifies a type of history that is truth itself, truth history. It's easy for God to identify truth history because he sees all, including the role of his own hand. It's almost impossible for the world to find truth history because it doesn't see much of anything. Fortunately, the Lord offers his help as the spirit of truth. Historical voices that invite the spirit of truth are good voices. Missionaries employ truth history, good voices, when they teach. If you examine it closely, Preach My Gospel is really just a bunch of history lessons. The first vision, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, Christ's life, death, and resurrection, the great apostasy, the restoration. It's history, virtually all of it. Even the plan of salvation is a history, reaching back before the earth was formed and far into the future where history hasn't happened yet. 
When the spirit of truth confirms a history to be things as they were, its voice is of God, reflecting the values, community, behavior that fulfill God's purpose and create his social order here on earth. In contrast to truth history, the Lord also explains a version of not truth history. In verses 25 and 39 of 93, he explains, and whatsoever is more or less than, th than this, things as they are, were, or are to come, is the spirit of that wicked one who was a liar from the beginning. And that wicked one cometh and taketh away light and truth from the children of men because of the tradition of their fathers. The Book of Mormon prepared by Christ, the spirit of truth himself for us in our day, offers a perfect example. The Nephites and the Lamanites shared the same ancestor, hometown, language, and trek to the promised land. The Nephites heeded the brass plate's record and used its voice to interpret and remember their own experience. In contrast, the Lamanites remembered the past as nothing but a series of offenses that justified hatred against the Nephites. Packed with righteous indignation, blame, and accusation, this historical voice used derogatory language, sought vengeance, and produced divisive us versus them lines of identity. It objectified, demonized, and enslaved. Mormon calls this version of historical memory wicked traditions. These wicked traditions, a chosen version of history, produced a thousand years of hatred. The Lamanites didn't destroy the Nephites. It was wicked traditions. In their last decades, the Lamanites and the Nephites both embraced wicked tradition versions of history as the two historical voices fed hate into each other and inflamed each other in escalating provocations. Violence swept everything. History has the power to build society. It also has the power to destroy society. The great challenge of our age, in this, the last dispensation, <clears throat> Uh, is very much the same as that of the great conflict of the Book of Mormon, except now globalization and technology mean that battle lines are everywhere. In almost every corner of the globe, the beautiful voice of Zion, a song of love offering salvation to any who will receive it, competes with accusatory shouts of wicked tradition versions of history. This brings us to verse 53 of section 93. In my original question, why would the Lord command us to obtain a knowledge of history and of countries and of kingdoms and all this for the salvation of Zion? Several lines of thought come to mind, but I'm going to explain only two. First, a knowledge of history can transform our hearts and fill them with great spiritual power. Our Savior shows us how. In Gethsemane, Christ shouldered the sins of each and every one of us. He came to know every betrayal, foul thought, and dirty deed. He saw us truthfully, as we are. Technically, in Gethsemane, he obtained a knowledge of history, mine, yours, all of our histories. Rather than accuse us, however, he chose to see us as we can become, and that choice transformed him. Alma explains this beautifully. And he, Christ, will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death. And he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy, that he may know how to succor his people according to their infirmities. It was history, our personal histories, that filled the Savior with enough mercy and knowledge to heal us. Because he chose to see good in us, our histories somehow helped infuse him with new levels of power. Christ already possessed more love and charity than anyone, but he got even more when he obtained a knowledge of history, your history. If we do as the Savior did, obtain a knowledge of history, and choose to see divine purpose in it, choose to search for God's hand in it, choose to seek input from the spirit of truth, we too can gain knowledge of things as they are and were. At that point, we will see in a limited sense the way God sees. 
When we see others and their history as God sees them, his spirit will fill us with his mercy, light, and power. This isn't new. Most of us have already covenanted to do exactly this. At the Waters of Mormon, Alma asked his followers if they were willing to bear one another's burdens, mourn with those who mourn, and comfort those who stand in need of comfort. <clears throat> what is this, if not obtaining the knowledge of history about our neighbors, local, national, and global, allowing the spirit of truth to fill our hearts with mercy and compassion, and then using this new power to lift the burdens produced by that same history? That's what Christ did for us. That's what all who love truth should do to follow him. To me, this is history's ultimate power, its capacity to invite the spirit of truth and fill our hearts with faith, conviction, compassion, and charity, the building blocks of miracles. The enemy hates such hearts and employs a powerful weapon against them, wicked traditions, versions of history. In 1998, Elder Richard G. Scott warned us about them, saying, quote, Your Heavenly Father assigned you to be born into a specific lineage from which you received your inheritance of race, culture, and traditions. That lineage can provide a rich heritage and great reasons to rejoice. Yet, you have the responsibility to determine if there is any part of that heritage that must be discarded because it works against the Lord's plan of happiness. These wicked traditions, the parts that must be discarded, appear in many forms, accusing other nations, other ethnicities, other cultures, other classes, other communities. They foster hate of all sorts. The most common form of wicked traditions among us here right now are the dark histories that we create about ourselves. Many of us looking in the mirror take a dim view about where our past has taken us. <clears throat> in God's glorious wisdom, however, what happens in the past doesn't matter so much. The past is past. It doesn't change. However, how we choose to remember the past matters immensely. Every story, every experience we have, both the exquisite and the excruciating, can advance a soothing voice of truth or the angry growl of wicked traditions. We choose. Because our Savior chose to see good in us, we also have the power to choose how we remember history. We can choose to heed him, the spirit of truth, apply his atoning sacrifice to us, see ourselves as he sees us, the way we are, the way we truthfully are. We can't change the past, but Thanks to Christ, we can change the imprint it leaves on us and fill our hearts with his light in the process. Many examples in the scriptures portray the remarkable transformation of people who leave bad, dark pasts and enter the light. Alma the Younger, the sons of Mosiah, Saul who became Paul, the list is endless. There's no reason why that can't be applied to us as well. This brings us to my second point about verse 53. In this great day of gathering, efforts to obtain a knowledge of history and of countries and of kingdoms can also knit hearts in unity, establishing Zion and, and spreading peace worldwide. The antidote to wicked traditions is truth, knowledge of things as they are, were, and are to come. However, Truth does not function like a cleaning, agent, a cleaning agent or a medicine. You can't use it to scrub off wicked traditions or inject it like a vaccine. To have any effect, truth must persuade. It must change hearts, altering the beliefs, feelings, and loyalties that bind people to their traditions. Without any way to get inside a person, without a soft heart to receive it, truth only fuels angry reactions like the kind that killed Abinadi and Joseph Smith and even Christ himself. Ironically, an extremely powerful way to soften the hearts of others is 
to obtain a knowledge of history, their history. Knowing the history of others earns you a chance to stand within their community because it is history that helps define that community in the first place. It changes you from an outsider, ignorant, suspect, apart, into someone who might understand us, someone possibly worthy of trust. This process happens all the time. Missionaries teach the gospel, history, really. As investigators accept it, the missionaries, the bishop, and other members come to know the investigator's backstory. They exchange information, and this exchange of histories, plus the new shared narrative of the conversion process itself, expands sympathy, trust, and loyalty, knitting all together in love and fellowship. In the Book of Mormon, this pattern unites entire peoples. Several times, large groups of outsiders ask to join the Nephite nation. Zarahemla's people, Limhi's refugees, Alma's converts, and King Antinephi Lehi's immigrants. Each time, every time, the newcomers and the Nephites first exchange their stories of the past. They open their records and read of their genealogies and their past experiences. As both sides come to know the other, sympathies flow, trust rises, and hearts soften, uniting two people into one. The exchange of history does more than just transfer information. When we share our histories with others and the spirit of truth confirms things as they are and were, we and our new friends begin to see each other as God sees us. Mercy and compassion flow between us. If either side has cause to mourn or burdens to bear, hearts fill with mercy and compassion to bursting and yearn to alleviate suffering with selfless acts of kindness. Service is the natural root. In the end, hearts on both sides are knit as one. This unity is the defining characteristic of Zion. In the Book of Moses, the Lord says so. And the Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and one mind. Exchanging histories has the power to draw converts to Zion and unify them with the saints and vice versa. It also has the power to bind Zion with other communities, uniting both in acts of service and goodness across the globe. In this great day of gathering, our objective must be unity. The Lord warns, I say unto you, be one. And if you are not one, ye are not mine. If we are not perfectly unified, why are we not his? It's because he is the spirit of truth. The purpose of the spirit of truth is to show things as they are, to cause the outcome of unification. Any community that isn't unified clearly does not have the spirit of truth, does not have his spirit, and hence cannot be his. It's no accident that the day of gathering opened with the coming forth of a history, the Book of Mormon. It's also no accident that even before Moroni repeatedly taught Joseph Smith the prophecy of Malachi, and he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. I like this verse. It contains all the pieces. As the Lord places in our hearts the promises he made to our fathers, covenants he made with people long ago, ancient history really, our hearts shall turn to the fathers. Once again we see the pattern. The formula is clear. History confirmed by the spirit of truth binds hearts and builds unity, this time across generations. In conclusion, if we are to gather our brothers and sisters to the safety of Zion, a community with specific values and behavior, we're going to need all the power that history has to offer. Our part requires that we obtain a knowledge of history, choose to see good in our history and that of others, and pray for God to send his spirit of truth 
once his spirit reveals how things really are, things as they are, we'll see others as God sees them. Our hearts will be transformed, and the hearts of others will be softened at the same time. God's light and love will knit those hearts into unbreakable bombs of loyalty, love, and com commitment. We will be one. If that happens, brothers and sisters, the salvation of Zion will be assured. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.